You spoke about the capex cycle being a problem for earnings. Uh, what about the NPL problem? Because a lot of people say that is the reason why credit growth is low and growth is actually not being able to uh, flesh out as as well as it could. What's the political way around the NPL problem? Because the finance ministry started talking about addressing this problem from a policy perspective now. Yes, I mean we've been um, you know we've been hearing this for the past two and a half years. I think there was a committee that came out also about uh, how to solve some of these issues and um, you know that's the biggest impediment I would argue to India's growth and a big risk factor also that when you have state-owned banking system which is pretty much crippled and NPLs at 15 16 percent it's definitely a problem I mean remember the whole world used to worry about NPLs in the Chinese banking system now a uh, lot of people are worried uh, about Indian banking system and the risk is that more and more international investors start to worry about NPLs in the state-owned banking systems, just like China. What's your prescription? What is your solution politically? What would be acceptable to you from a market point of view? Well, it's difficult for me to say, but again, there are you know expert committees mm -hmm. that have been out there, which you know have argued either to create a bad bank or um, you know other situations, other op other ways to get around that. I mean, the big advantage for India is also huge amount of domestic savings. So mm. there are enough financial instruments available which have been tried in the West which can be used to solve some of these NPL issues. Mm. I mean, and you have a market that has done phenomenally well. So, you know, with the right set of policies, the government of India can actually take advantage of capital markets to solve some of these issues. Mm. Sticking with banking, where do you see the monetary policy cycle right now? Do you think interest rates have bottomed out for the near term, given the recent inflation readings that you have seen? Is there a threat that, contrary to what one believed three months back, rates might actually head up? You know, some of the other, I think domestic liquidity is quite strong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what is the driver for credit growth is not interest rates, but just a lack of demand for credit, given right. the poor state of Indian economy. So I don't think so, even if rates have come down by 50, 70 basis points or 100 basis points, corporate credit will pick up. Will pick up. But I like some of the initiatives the government has done, especially for interest subvention, especially in low cost housing, um, even in middle class housing. So obviously that will make an impact, you know, because rates in that sector has already come down by about 100, 200 basis points. Mm. Your mandate at GMO is to focus on sectors or themes which are very country specific uh, yes. and not export specific or yes. global. So what kind of themes do you pay in India from a sector? I mean, if IT, pharma, chemicals, the big export sectors are ruled out, what is the basket that you are left with in India? Well, the mandate for my fund is to buy domestic businesses and mm. the attraction is pretty clear is these domestic businesses are uncorrelated um, to what's happening in the West. It doesn't matter whether Fed raises interest rates or not, but if we can find businesses which can march on its own beat, whether it's in India or in other countries, I mean, that's a good investment thesis in our opinion. Mm. So in India, given the demographics, given the opportunity, there are a lot of domestic driven sectors which offer you that kind of growth. Uh, whether it's a private sector banks, hospitality, healthcare, infrastructure. So these are businesses that can just do well. I mean, the question is whether you grow at, you know, 12% or 17%, but obviously growth is there and that's what we like. But willy-nilly then is your portfolio too skewed in favor of financials? Well, we have a significant bet towards financials and, um, you know, but we also like a lot of other sectors uh, in India, infrastructure, um, gas uh, beneficiaries and so on. Infrastructure despite the fact that the capex cycle has been pretty much dead for the last three four years? Yes, but we are finding specific companies that uh, you know will benefit from likely spending infrastructure so we like such companies. Okay, you don't invest in IT per se because it's global but how do you read what's going on in the US with Trump policies uh, as a fallout towards Indian sectors which are exposed globally? So I worry about uh, the impact on Indian software. I mean, you know, um, I mean, the Indian software, which has been a big growth driver to Indian economy. I mean, people forget the point that it was, I think, the second largest job creator in the Indian economy. Um, it has jobs created in the software sector has a huge multiplier effect on the domestic economy, you know, 
you know, these professionals buy houses, buy cars, and there's a massive spillover in all aspects of Indian economy. Mm. So if this sector gets impacted either because of visa issues or um, inability of these some of these companies to do business as usual, it will start impact their domestic hiring plans. It will start impacting how many people, for example, can be on the bench. It will start impacting these businesses' mm -hmm. margins and can have a negative effect on the Indian economy, especially in a context where job creation is at a multi-decade low in India. So that's what I'm worried about. You know, unemployment or job creation gets such a lot of headlines across the world. In India, we don't seem to care too much about it. Uh, are you, d does it worry you that we are not addressing that aspect of it, I mean, which will c come around to bite that per capita growth figure that you were talking about finally? Absolutely. I mean, I find this uh, lack of discourse on uh, job creation extremely frustrating as an investor in India, as an Indian, to, um, you know, job creation is pretty much at multi-year lows. If it's, In fact, I think the recent data indicated that you have net job losses in a day. And the reason is nobody wants to talk about it because it's a tough problem. You know, unlike some of the other issues, when one can talk about it, there are no convenient, easy solutions. It requires huge amount of patience, huge amount of focus uh, to stick to one investment strategy, for example, from a, from a political perspective. And that's definitely not happening. And that's why maybe you see this discourse keeps moving from one area to another area, because it's a very sensitive and a touchy issue. Mm. Do you see any policy ans answers? How do you see the policy or political landscape in India in addressing some of these issues? Well, it's definitely the <coughs> government has uh, taken steps. I mean, you know, even though they are not big enough to move the needle, mm -hmm. but whether it is, for example, the government focus on IT, on Aadhaar, which basically will create a new industry, helps reach banking, reach a certain new level of so a different set of consumers. So it's quite positive that way. Uh, thrust on low-cost housing, again, that can create jobs. So, yes, these are steps being taken, but they are not, you know, big enough to move the needle in India, in my opinion. Let me ask you about another domestic focus sector, telecom, which has been out of the investor's book for the last four years, but has come back on the discussion table after the recent moves, idea of Vodafone, etc. Is it a sector one can look at in terms of good value, or would you s stay clear of it? Well, we don't like sectors where there's a lot of competitive intensity. So we've kind of avoided the sector. But if the valuations are reasonable or, you know, sentiments is incredibly poor, one will look into it. But right now, it looks like, you know, the competitive intensity will prevail and, you know, that prevents a cap on stock prices. Mm. So you said India is the middle of the pack from a short-term perspective. Which companies, uh, which countries look more attractive now in the Asian basket? Well, we like China quite a lot. More uh, than India? Absolutely. Um, you know, and my argument is very simple that the conventional wisdom is that, well, China has taken a lot of debt and it's going to implode one year on another. But but the devil is in the details. And unlike India, China has effectively used domestic savings to create a phenomenal infrastructure, huge amount of productivity boost. In fact, um, and it's moved, and it's doing the transition from a low value added country to spending on value addition. For example, this year, artificial I intelligence is number one priority for China this year. Mm. You know, in front of our eyes, in the space of 20 years, I mean, China per capita income was same as India in 1987. Today, per capita income in China is $8,000. And it's quite possible over the next 10, 15 years, we will see the transition of China moving from an emerging market country to a developed market country. Mm. So I'm quite bullish on on China because of that. So you think fears of China imploding are overstated? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I think uh, what people miss the point is that a lot of debt th that has been taken has been used to build infrastructure, has been used to build roads, has been used to build airports and so on. So 90, 85 or 90 percent of the debt in China is all domestic driven debt. So basically it's, you know, you're taking from a domestic saver to build an asset which is a point uh, not really well thought about by investors and politicians. Which other countries would you rate higher than India? I like Philippines quite a lot mm. in spite of some of the political issues that's going on. And I would argue that Philippines has been the biggest beneficiary of India's lack of 
focus towards education, towards the BPO sector. So a lot of jobs that initially came to India from BPOs and things like that have now moved to Philippines. So Philippines is pretty much moving towards a full employment. Per capita income is reached about $3,000. Fixed mm -hmm. asset investment is growing at about 25-27% a year compared to hardly any growth, for example, for India. So, so we like uh, countries uh, like Philippines. Mm. I'm a pleasure talking to you. Thank you Thank very you. much for your time.